In 1930s Edinburgh, young John Copland often left his house in the dead of night and drove his father's car, rather quickly, through the streets. But this wasn't joyriding. This was a matter of life and death and the early days of the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. In the 1920s and 30s, blood transfusion was in its infancy. And the UK's first blood donor service, run by the British Red Cross in London, had only started in 1921. This is a typical piece of apparatus from around the 1920s, 1930s. The donor and the patient would have been in very close proximity. You had a line that would go in to the donor, you would have a line that went into the patient, you would take the blood from the donor and then eject it into the patient. It was quite an intimidating procedure, so blood donors were scarce. Edinburgh dentist Jack Copland wanted to change that. His grandson Howard Copland has brought me back to the street where Jack lived and worked. A friend of his told him that his wife had, had died and she could have been saved if there had been a blood transfusion. Jack decided to start his own blood donation register, ferrying donors to the hospital. Within a few months, the service was getting so busy, Jack's dental practice began to suffer. It was getting too much for him, and he called on my father, who then was a teenager. Could you take on the nighttime calls? Hello. Every night, John would have to take calls from doctors needing blood. It was his responsibility to drive the donor to and from hospital in his father's car. He was only 13 and clearly underage. So did the authorities turn a blind eye? The Lord Provost of Edinburgh was a supporter of the blood transfusion, and so I think the, the police knew what was going on. In true John Copland style, we've got our very own 1930s Lanchester, and Howard's keen to show me his father's old destinations. The Royal Infirmary, the Hospital for Sick Children, and private hospitals in streets like Moray Place. People wrote to your grandfather and to your father mm. letters of thanks. Often it was a, an emergency situation and it didn't always turn out as you would hope. So I regret that the great human effort was in vain. I have lost my comforter, counsellor, everything in the world to me. But I pray to God that you, Mr Copland, will have health and strength to carry on your good work in the interests of humanity. Very touching, mm. so sad, and mm. you know, it was really selfless work. But worth it for the lives these transfusions saved. I wish to thank you very sincerely on behalf of my brother from Ward 3 of the Royal Infirmary for your real kindness in coming forward to give him a blood transfusion. We feel very grateful to you indeed. Wonderful. Mm. Jack Copland threw himself into fundraising and publicising the service. By 1936, he had a list of 350 blood donors and helped create the Edinburgh Blood Transfusion Service. By 1939, with the advent of blood banks, the cars were transporting donors' blood instead of the people themselves. Of course, speed was still of the essence. Last year, the service helped almost 31,000 people in Scotland with red cell blood transfusions. As an organisation, the principles are still the same. We're still 24-7, 365 days a year on call. And I think it was great foresight in Jack to realise how important blood was going to be in the future. So, Howard, what would a young John have made of this fast car with its blue lights? He'd have been right in there and off up the road. <laughs> a cloud of dust. <laughs> he would have loved it. Jack Copland and his young son John certainly left a brilliant legacy to the people of Scotland. And now the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service honours him with this building, the Jack Copland Centre Headquarters.